Thinking Aloud, conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with parapsychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we are going to look at the life and career, the work of a great Polish clairvoyant, a psychic virtuoso named Stefan Osowiecki who died tragically at the hands of the Nazis in 1944. My guest is Dr. Zofia Weaver, who serves on the Council of the Society for Psychical Research in England and has served as the editor of that journal, the Journal of the Society for Psychical Research. One of her main areas of interest in psychical research is the investigation of famous Polish psychics. Together with the late Mary Rose Barrington and the late Professor Ian Stevenson, she has written a comprehensive study of Stefan Osowiecki, published in 2005, titled A World in a Grain of Sand. Also, in 2015, she published Other Realities, the Enigma of Franek Kluski's Mediumship. Her current research interests include research into psychic virtuosos, past and present. This is an internet interview, and now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Zofia. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. It's nice to be here. You've been a member of the Society for Psychical Research for, I think, nearly four decades at this point. You've served as uh, the editor of uh, the journal for a period of years. Uh, You know, to my way of thinking, that society is probably the premier organization that's been researching psychic phenomena now for nearly 140 years. Yes, indeed. I think we are the oldest organization in it, still in existence since 1882. And uh, it feels like I've been there for a long time as well. You're absolutely right. I joined, I think, in the centenary year, 18, 1982. So uh, it's been a long time, but it's been very good and very rewarding. And uh, what can I say? Uh, As you know, or perhaps you don't, uh, perhaps the people who are watching, they don't know, but we are, basically, the society was established to investigate the faculties of men that don't get explained by science as it exists. And uh, we have no corporate opinions. So whatever I say is my own personal view. I don't speak on behalf of the society. Um, and I, I wonder how people hear about it these days, because in, when I joined, I found out about it by accident. I got a book out of the library, but it was, I wasn't particularly interested in anything paranormal. I just got the book out of the library because the title sounded interesting and, and it got me because it really was such a sane book, uh, which is perhaps not quite what I expected, um, especially as it started with, strangely enough, um, a kind of uh, card reading experiment, you know, the rhyme experiments, and how they were above chance. And I thought that was so totally unexpected. And then the book described the history and the activities of uh, the Society for Psychical Research, and and I got got hooked. So in those days, um, it was everything was much more formal, and I was really delighted and surprised when they accepted my application to join. And as I say, it's really it didn't change my life so much as gave it a sort of. Uh, an added dimension that has really been very rewarding. And nowadays, of course, you can uh, find everything about this society, or perhaps not everything, but most of it, on its website, 
which is www.sbracuk. And um, there are other books about uh, our history around. Um, but um, we're still doing what we are supposed we, we started out uh, doing, just in slightly different formats as times change. So it started out with basically the debate about the meaning of human beings in history. And as you remember, Darwin, the in evolution, spiritualism, and people searching for answers. And the founders uh, established committees to look into these questions of uh, spontaneous, as they are now known, spontaneous cases, people's accounts of apparitions, of strange communications, um, and various other aspects. Hypnotism was another area uh, of interest because, of course, psychology was just beginning as a subject in those days as well. And so it was extremely active and there were a number of publications that are still around and still worth reading. My favourite is uh, Phantasms of the Living by Gurney and Myers and Podmore. It's still really fascinating, as is Myers' human personality and survival um, of bodily death. So, and that's, we, we're going back to the 1880s, 90s, and early 1900s. So, um, we still do these things. Uh, we investigate mediums, and of course, we support a lot of um, experimental work now done at universities. Yeah, I think it's worthwhile to mention that you have incredible archives, uh, decades and decades of, of research studies. And that is very important because by now we have acquired another dimension. We are of great importance historically because so many important figures were members of the society or involved in, with the society in some, some way. So, yes. Um, there is that dimension as well now, um, and uh, we have now, I don't know if you're aware, Sci Encyclopedia, which is free, which is uh, available on the website, and I think that is very useful because these days it's not always easy to find reliable information about the earlier activities and, in fact, what's happening in the field. Well, let's talk about uh, Osovietsky. I think... Uh, one of the fascinating things uh, about him and about Poland in general, I don't think uh, many of our viewers realize that Poland was really not even officially a country for over a century between, I think, 1795 and 1918. There was no official country called Poland. Absolutely. It was partitioned between Russia, Austria, and Prussia. And... Uh, it is quite amazing that over that long period of time, the sense of national identity survived. And uh, there was, uh, when, when basically it was the First World War that allowed Poland to come on the map again. Um, and uh, a lot of the people who were uh, participants in the experiments uh, with Osowiecki and with Kluski, were people who were involved in setting up uh, the new state and f first of all fighting for it and then setting it up. So I find the period fascinating and it was, it's a, the period that, that it, at home I grew up with the stories of it. So yeah, it, it's of particular interest because I know my granny had been to see Osovietsky, <laughs> things like that. And a friend, my best friend, when I, st when I told her, when I mentioned that I was writing about Osovietsky, she said, oh, my grandfather knew him well. <laughs> so it's, it makes you feel 
what a pity I didn't know this. I wasn't interested before. It never came up because I missed those people just by a decade or two. Let's start with his birth. I think that alone is is fascinating. I believe he was born to a very wealthy family living in uh, Moscow, I think. Well, yes, because uh, his father had a, a, a chemist, a chemical plant. I think he, they did paints and things like that. And in fact, in his youth, I think he was an assistant to Mendeleev, you know, the one with the periodic table. Um, so they grew, he, he certainly grew up in a very well-to-do um, family um, on the best of terms with um, the ruling aristocratic circles because his brother-in-law was tutor to one of the, I think, one of the Grand Duke's children. So they they really had the best of it. Um, and it's quite amazing how they kept their identity and um, how active they were in the Polish cause when, as soon as they got the opportunity. He had a very privileged uh, upbringing. Uh, he took over the running of the company when his father died uh, in the, I think, 1914 or 15. But then, of course, the revolution came and he had a very traumatic experience of, uh, because he was uh, on a committee sort of, you know, for Poles fighting for freedom and he had contacts with the French and so he became very... Uh, very much suspected, so he was arrested, and it has been confirmed from a number of sources that he was expected to be executed, expecting to be executed, and he was held in horrible conditions, and he said that that was what triggered his clairvoyance, or whatever you want to call it. Now, isn't it also the case that uh, as a young man, even prior to his imprisonment, he he met a a gifted mystic or or psychic who who worked with him, became his spiritual tutor, and helped him develop his abilities. That is certainly part of uh, his autobiography. Um, he wrote about it, how he was on basically on work experience um, in, in a company. Um, in the middle of nowhere, and uh, he was as he was looking for something exciting to do. He was told to go and see this elderly Jew uh, who was a mystic, and according to Osovetsky, he went and spoke to him. And the Brubel, his name was, told him everything about himself and taught him, um, told him he had the gift and taught him how to use it, which basically was very much visualization. But that's all we know. Nobody has succeeded in tracing uh, the actual person. And it's, I mean, it's very difficult to dig deep into the history because, because of all the turmoil that took place in Russia and uh, Ukraine and everywhere you know, where he had links. Well, I think the the fact that a a person with such psychic gifts grew up in such turbulent circumstances, you know, living through the Russian Revolution, living through the establishment of a new state in in Poland, and then the Second World War and the Nazi occupation and the uh, insurrection in in, in Warsaw, the uh, uprising in Warsaw, all all of that. Uh, strikes me as um, I'm trying to find the right word for it. Um, I, I guess the key is when I read your biography of Osovietsky, he seemed to have a certain inner poise, like he understood that he was living through turbulent times. I think his mentor, Rubel, it, it told him that this would happen and he, he faced it with great dignity. He did, but he wasn't alone in that. I mean, lots of people did. Uh, lots of people, that whole generation had it pretty tough. Um, and they did tremendous things. So um, 
he was not alone, but he was uh, very special in in his kindness. He really was, uh, and, and I heard it from you know number of people, not just accounts, written accounts, that he never turned anybody away during the war. People went with their bits of stuff, trying to locate or find out what happened to their loved ones. But there were queues outside his door for days, and he would always try and and help. And it unfortunately, it's also a very um, a period where there is no evidence because he wouldn't. First of all, people wouldn't keep records. But secondly, he admitted that he sometimes lied when this story was just too horrible to recount. So yes, he was he was a wonderful person, I think. I understand, for example, that uh, throughout his entire life uh, working as a clairvoyant, he never charged uh, anybody for anything. Oh, no, no. I mean, uh, in our book, we didn't go through all his beliefs, but I have, he in his book, there is a whole chapter uh, about his philosophy. And the main thing, the most important thing about it is that he regarded it as a gift, as a step in the evolution of mankind, which sounds a bit lofty, but that's what he believed. And that is why I think, you know, if he, if he were to charge for it, well, I think, you know, thunder and lightning and bolts from heaven, uh, you know, he, he really felt that was, that he had been perhaps not chosen, but he certainly had a gift that he had to give to mankind. And apart from that, I think he really enjoyed being special. Um, I mean, more so in the, okay, that it was a turbulent time, but it was really a nice place to be in, you know, with the nightlife and uh, society life that he enjoyed and of course he was extremely popular because partly because of his gift and partly because of his connections I mean he really he really came in at the top because his uh, brother-in-law uh, was an adjutant to to the head of state you know after Poland's independence so you can't <laughs> you can't really do much better than that in fact I understand that uh, I the head of state, whose name I probably cannot pronounce correctly. Piłsudski. Piłsudski. He, uh, he actually participated in research with Osowiecki. Yes, he did. Yes, yes. The, the, it, it, and it's very well documented. And so did his uh, adjutants and a, a lot of people, you know, from that background. He worked extensively with scientists to document his his abilities with with well known scientists and uh, people high in society, but in particular with psychical researchers who were very astute in in that era. Yes, indeed. I mean, he was. It is very fortunate for us, as much as anything else, that it was Jelly and Richer who honed in on him and. These are some of the best documented uh, pieces uh, of evidence uh, that you can have. And there was also the Polish society. Um, I will not try to give it a name because they formed little groups with names, but they all intermingled and worked together. But there were some truly good people who worked uh, with um, with the French and, in fact, uh, some of the best uh, the most interesting cases came through the Polish uh, society um, who arranged um, the experiments together with the French. With one of the famous ones is the Yonki story, where a gentleman had asked a Polish researcher if Osowiecki would read, well, would tell what's in the package that he gave to this Polish researcher. Well, nothing happened because Osobiecki was always on the run somewhere. And then the gentleman in, uh, who came from Vilnius died. And it turned out there is a packet prepared by someone who has died, and therefore nobody knows what's in it. So it is a very interesting story how he, Osobiecki, I think, got 
all of it right. And it was such a mixture of things in that box. Um, even, even I think there was a bit of sugar left over. <laughs> How she got that as well. So yes, it is. And it's all very well documented with witnesses, with signed reports. And I mean, what more can you ask for? Typically, I gather these uh, tests uh, involved uh, Osovietsky uh, describing the contents of objects uh, and pictures that were sealed inside of boxes or envelopes. Yes, basically, I think I've, I've calculated that of all the uh, reported experiments, uh, the about 70 percent was written things in envelopes and it before anybody sort of objects. Yes, some of them were done under imperfect conditions because, you know, the person wrote it in the same room and you can always object. I think I've got a list somewhere of all the objections you can make. But he couldn't have guessed the drawing that was sealed in a lead pipe that the French brought with them. So <laughs> a lot and a lot of them were um, of that quality. And if you look at the drawings, um, they are remarkably accurate. Um, and so were the written uh, bits that people would put in. And again, it was it was very good because they were not. A lot of the things were prepared by people outside the the area of experiment. So nobody knew was the, the experimenters didn't know what was in it. And also the quality of the uh, um, actual thing to guess to, to, to guess the nature of uh, unusual. You don't get the usual the a house, a tree, a fish. You know, actually, you do get a fish once, but, um, but but not the usual sort of thing that come to mind when people think of something. Oh, you know, to, to draw or write. They are usually very obscure little things um, that he gets right. On top of doing uh, extensive research over many years with well-known researchers, Charles Roche, for example, was a Nobel laureate scientist, uh, he also helped people with their personal problems. And one instance that really struck me involved locating a, a body that had been buried in a mass grave. I know. And that is that is actually very well documented because it was publicized and in fact there were uh, i have a um, copy of a, a document that was being prepared by uh, his widow for publication based on his account of what happened but there are independent accounts because everybody knows about that battle in poland uh, which was in 1939 where there were 700 bodies buried. Uh, you, 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 well, yes, you, you don't want to imagine what the, the scene, but they were buried in rows of, you know, on one on top of another. And Osovetsky, his, the family of this young cadet who died there, they went to Osovetsky because, like so many people in Poland, especially at that time, they were really desperate to have the body to be buried properly, uh, because that's part of our tradition. And so they went to Osobietsky with, a, a, I think, a photograph or a letter, and he told them where it would be, where the body would be, but uh, because of there were so many bodies, and he also told them it wouldn't be the one on top. So he went, uh, when they went to dig the body up, and According to what his wife reports, he got he got scared because there was so much publicity. You know, there were people looking, and and so he went and sat down and asked the cadet to tell him where he was, and and so a a sort of a cloud of smoke appeared over one row, and that's where they found the body, exactly as as described. Uh, they recognized the body by the mending on the trousers that the boy's mother had done and something else like that. 
So yes, and that 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 actually happens to be very well documented. Well, there are many other uh, stories like that. I uh, I think another very important part of uh, the Asovietsky. Uh, History is is that he worked extensively with an archaeologist Poniatowski. Yes, he he did thirty odd experiments on uh, uh, archaeological objects during the war with Poniatowski, and I'm just working my way through uh, these experiments because we commissioned a Polish archaeologist to try and find the artifacts that Poniatowski used and uh, try and relate Osovietsky's accounts to um, current knowledge of archaeology. And as I say, I'm still working on putting it all into a tables of because that's what the archaeologist did. He wrote a report, but he also did uh, some superb tables with every experiment, what's right, what's wrong. And I would really love to know just how, just how to it, because let us not pretend that Osovietsky always got it right. And also, uh, he, when, when he was doing psychometry for people with a very specific um, goal, if you like, you know, where are they, what are they doing, whatever, where it's fallen through. Uh, that's very different from going asking someone to go to this period and describe what's happening. Now, that uh, <laughs> one of the things that the archaeologist has told us is that he thinks quite a few of these artifacts the, that they thought were man-made, flints and whatever, were in fact eoliths, which were nat natural objects that would, that well, didn't have a, a personal history. And, and so he would be floundering, I think. So uh, it's still work in progress. And anybody who has any knowledge of archaeology, uh, remote viewing archaeology and things, I would really love to, to put that in context because I'm, as a, when, just before you came on, I was trying to create an Excel table of, of all these experiments and what the current thinking uh, has been. So, yes, so it never stops, you know. So I'm basing my assessment on a book that was published decades ago uh, by Stefan Schwartz, The Secret Vaults of Time, where he has an extensive chapter. I have read it, yes. Mm, yes, and it's, you know, but the, like us, like all of us, he didn't have access to the actual artifacts. Uh, and I think the, the point is being made by the Polish archaeologist that uh, they are not necessarily what people thought they were. So uh, <laughs> they might have been misleading or Sovietsky. <laughs> you know, a field like archaeology, like any other science, is always advancing, and uh, the discoveries of one generation are often challenged by subsequent generations. Absolutely, but the one thing that uh, is actually that has hit the archaeologist as well. There was a uh, um, an artifact from a, a, a settlement in Poland, I think it's about 700 something, you know, uh, that Osovietsky described in great detail and ve very accurately. And yet at the time it was just being excavated. He couldn't have known. Not only that, but he said, and there was a bigger settlement a bit further on uh, in the sort of, after the war, they did find another settlement. So how, how, how you judge these things, it's very difficult because, of course, it could be a lucky guess. Um, but on the other hand, with the, 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 the settlement, there's so much detail that is so unusual. It's all on stilts on the lake. <laughs> You just don't get that sort of thing just like that. So I don't know. On the other hand, of course, people did know what 
the objects were or they what they thought they were so telepathy i don't know i do need some help with that well, the archaeologist he worked with, Poniatowski, obviously felt he was getting good data because he kept doing these. He did nearly 40 different experiments with uh, Osovietsky. Yes, he did, because that was, that was, he based his theory or, and approach on evidence of Osovietsky's sort of, you know, track record in finding objects that are missing and finding and telling you the history of the person as, you know, um, a lot more about the person than actually the object itself. So he thought it would work with um, going back in time. Um, but, um, well, as I say, it's still a work in progress. Another interesting feature of uh, Osovietsky's life to me is in spite of the fact that he did so well working with scientists, uh, he apparently was unable or unwilling to apply his own psychic abilities for personal benefit. Uh, he, for example, uh, although he was born into a wealthy family and had many business interests, uh, according to reports, he was not a good businessman at all and probably lost most of his fortune. Well, he didn't bring much of a fortune out of Russia, I'm pretty sure. But... Uh, he, it was his personality. I mean, uh, th there was a, there is a chapter about him by somebody who knew him in the, in the sort of you know the the, the guest from that fourth dimension or something. And he said that man just couldn't believe that people could do wrong. You know, he was. I mean, and if you if you see some of the experiment, not not experiments, when people had asked him to find the culprit or he would tell you where the object was and um he would help you find it but he would not reveal um the guilty a, a number of stories like that and so i suppose that applies to uh, you know if somebody asked him to invest in a silly scheme you know nobody would do something on purpose like that would they and he was i mean he really was extremely popular because he was so trusting and why he was so trusting um, i mean i don't think he had an insight into human nature put it this way not no he was always looking on the good side of people well i get a sense that ultimately he trusted the universe that he understood so something a little deeper. For example, right in the middle of the Second World War, when the Nazis are invading Poland, he had the opportunity to escape to uh, Italy, where he would have been safer, and he turned it down. He didn't want to leave. He knew what was going to happen. Well, as I say, I'm not sure what the uh, what the motivation was. I don't know that he knew what he was. He never claimed to have precognition gifts. Uh, he was... Uh, um, he was expected to, to, to pronounce on things, but he never actually, I mean, the people who knew him um, said he, he wouldn't, he wouldn't uh, prophesy. It wasn't his job. And he certainly didn't apply to himself. Obviously, he would have been worried like so many people were, and he may have had premonitions, as people do. But, I mean, the first thing I ever heard about him uh, in in my family was when the name of Sovietsky was mentioned. I said, oh, oh, he was the one whose life, wife left him, and he had no clue. The <laughs> whole of war so new. <laughs> but he said he just didn't. He just couldn't work out. He, he had a blank on on you know his personal fate. So I assume that's how it was. And I don't think anybody expected the war to last as long as, as it did. You know, I mean, talking to my family and, you know, looking at... I mean, people thought it would be over quickly. Well, wasn't it the case, though, I thought I read in your book that his mentor, Vrobel, Vrubel, when he was a young man, uh, told him that he was going to die violently. Well, yes, but we have only, you know, we have only Osovetsky's autobiography of it, and he, that he was writing about time. I mean, I dare say that's true, 
but gosh, I'm I'm terrible like that. I only I always have these caveats um, about what has been shown to be the case and what uh, may be true is probably true. There's no reason to believe it's not true. You are uh, evaluating his life and his career from the perspective of a psychical researcher, which is quite appropriate. Not not to simply uh, accept uh, unverified accounts. It's amazing the legends that grew around him. First, you, you'd believe he could raise the dead, you know, the, the stories, because he really was famous, he was popular, and um, um, quite deservedly, but, well, you know, stories do grow. And there, so that's why in the book we only included those that we could find confirmation of, rather than the hearsay. I seem to recall you writing about uh, stories in which he seemed to be able to exert a mental influence over other people. I know, and one of them was told to me by my friend who is totally truthful, and that is the story in her family, how her, uh, I think her aunt uh, was um, uh, adamant, oh no, no, and he made her kneel in front of him. <laughs> but... Uh, this is just, this is anecdotal, okay, but there are other ones that are very well confirmed uh, where he said he would make somebody do something. Like, I think one of the famous ones, and well documented because there were witnesses, he said, I will make so-and-so come here now. Well, the so-and-so turns up and said, because suddenly I had this urge to come here. <laughs> And uh, I think one of the people, the witnesses, was a sort of well-known Polish composer, among other people. So yes, um, that that one is confirmed. Um, and uh, and of course the biolocation, you know, the turning up in people's rooms, uh, unannounced, <laughs> women screaming. Yeah. That also that has been confirmed by Jele and the person involved. So. I think we can, and he's not the only one to have done that. So I would, I, I like, I like patterns. <laughs> and there are other people who have had similar experience, then it becomes much more uh, reliable. Now, you mentioned Jele. He's Gustav Jele was the head of the Institut Metapsychique in Paris. Yes, indeed. Yes. Um, and he would, he visited Poland uh, on a number of occasions, and he would always see Osobiecki and Kluski, of course, and get his little paraffin hands with him. But uh, yeah, but but as I say, some of the the the, the core of Osobiecki's evidence is that that Jele and Risha produced between them, and particularly Jele because he was there more often and. And he had, he must have had the knack of getting the best out of people, of making friends, because he he really got the best out of both our best psychics. Well, and I imagine that might have something to do with the fact that Jaili and uh, Riche were both very uh, upper class individuals in their own society, so uh, they saw Osovietsky as uh, socially as a peer. Yes. Oh, I think it all helped. Yes, there was no. Uh, there is with mediums, which we don't use that about Osovietsky uh, or Kluski. But there is always this relationship of sort of uh, the medium is a tool, um, and the experimenters instruct the tool what to do. Here, here, that was much more of a friendship, which I'm sure helps, helps the psi element to come spontaneously. I guess we're just about at a point where it's probably useful to talk about his death. I, I gather it, it, it was a horrible thing. He, he was part of a, a mass execution that took place in Warsaw by the Nazis. 
That's right, yes. Yes, there were lots of, uh, they never found out how many, but you're talking about hundreds of men, because the women were separated and the men were taken in groups and shot. And that, and we think that's where Osobietsky perished, and so did his book, um, that the manuscript that he had with him called Immortality. And we'll never know. But uh, yes, I think that is the most likely uh, thing because uh, an, a neighbor, uh, I mean, he, Osobietsky was separated from his wife, but a neighbor who was dragged out later saw him among those men. And uh, that was that. Um, he was one of those who were uh, shot so, who were killed so mindlessly. Cruelly and shame. It is a shame. Uh, you know, it's it, it's a funny story in the sense that it exemplifies maybe some of the highest, furthest reaches of human nature on the one hand, and on the other hand, some some of the ugliest aspects of human nature all boiled into one story. Yes. Yes, indeed. I think we're fortunate uh, that we don't live in, in that era ourselves right now for all the troubles that we have, and, and I don't want to minimize them, but at, at that time, in the 1940s, things were much worse. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I know I've grown up with those stories. Uh, my father was in the uprising, you know, my family had to leave war, so when, after the uprising, um, and what they went through is just, well, it's another story, but there were a lot of people who went through pretty hellish experience and survived and produced us, which I think is uh, quite an achievement. <laughs> Well, it's also interesting to think about the relationship between war and psychical research because so many families, when they lose their children in, in war, they, they're drawn to seek communication through uh, mediums. And uh, as a result, we have a, in your archives at the SPR a lot of data. Oh, yes, yes, indeed. Uh, but that wouldn't have been in Poland because obviously I know I know the history and I Mrs. Piper and the, there's tremendous amount of very interesting stuff cross correspondences uh, various experiments and what Julie Byshaw's doing now is fantastic but we had a different history in fact being very Catholic Roman Catholic you don't double in trying to contact the dead. The dead are okay, God's looking after them. But we uh, we have a tradition of being very concerned about the remains, you know, the mortal remains. And in fact, uh, it's changing now, but All Saints Day, you have whole special trains, special buses where people go to visit the graves of the relatives. That's how important it is. So uh, we don't have a history of mediumship of that kind, um, even though you will find it sprouting in various contexts. The, the And sometimes you, well, you have very puzzling situations, but there hasn't been this sort of, there have been clairvoyants um, offering services, but not officially uh, looking for contact with your dead. In fact, uh, that was frowned upon by the church. It still is. You know, I, I have um, contacts with the uh, Polish, very interesting uh, journal, um, a monthly, and there you find sometimes, you know, reports from people who had dreams of the departed ones and what have you, and were told off for <laughs> by the priest when they went to confession. <laughs> Stop that at once. <laughs> well, I gather the the situation was very different in England. Oh yes. Yes, indeed. Yes, of course. I mean, and spiritualism as a um, 
uh, as a movement, as a religion, yeah, it's very, it's still going strong, um, and and that's that's fine. And they they it never, as I say, there, there was a spiritualist. There was much more sort of esoteric movement in Poland in the 1920s and 30s. More, much more interest in sort of theosophy kind of thing rather than straightforward trying to because basically that's what spiritualism is trying to contact the dead and you know fine I gather that Osovietsky, in his autobiography where he talks about his philosophy, he seemed to be very influenced by what you could call the Western esoteric tradition, uh, Rosicrucianism, theosophy, things of that sort. Yes. Oh, yes, that's right. Yes. And um, he uh, he liked, I mean, I will never say anything nasty about Osovietsky, but it was a very sort of a philosophy to fit uh, his um, his worldview rather than investigating philosophy, so to speak. <laughs> it shaped his attitude to his gift, which is the main thing. It sort of protected him from becoming too um, too proud, too, you know, too too much of a guru. <laughs> And, and I suspect that the sense that he had of trusting the universe maybe arose out of that philosophy as well. Yes, yes, indeed. Yeah. Especially when you are supposed to be doing, <coughs> have, a, have a part to play in the universal plan. Yeah. Well, Dr. Zofia Weaver, this has been a remarkable conversation. I'm so glad that we've had this opportunity to look at what I think for most people is a forgotten part of our history, but, but a very important part for people to remember. Yes, and now um, I'm doing a, a project which does involve Osovietsky and other equivalents. And now I look at these things and there is so much material in different countries in uh, just just forgotten now, you know. Okay, so remote viewers will m m mention war collier or, and, and, and perhaps mental radio and that's it. But there has been so much of interest um, that is really worth looking at more closely, including Osovietsky and details of what he said and the context in which he said it and what it tells us about what actually is going on. Zofia, thank you so much for being with me. Pleasure. I really enjoyed talking about my one of my special people. And we have, uh, for benefit of our viewers, another conversation planned on the, the great Polish medium, Franek Kluski. Yes, and that's really mind-boggling all the way. <laughs> and for those of you watching, thank you for being with us.